Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our 2024 Economic Outlook webinar. I'm Jude Kovis, the Managing Principal of Matthews, Carter & Boyce. We are a full-service CPA firm in Fairfax, Virginia. We've been servicing businesses, individuals, not-for-profit organizations for over 75 years. Many of the people who have joined us today are part of that group. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'd also like to make an announcement today that we uh, uh, have the Tom Fuller Foley Group has joined us effective January 1st. Uh, the Foley Group is a full service CPA firm uh, that have been representing this market and been in this market for over 50 years. And we're happy to have them part of the MCB family. We think that they will be able to broaden the scope of and depth of our services, especially in the tax advisory arena, as well as the outsourced accounting arena. And, and they also hold true to our vision of trying to expand by bringing in the best and brightest and being able to therefore service our clients in a superior manner. So thank you for that group, for Tom and his group for joining us and we're excited for the uh, years ahead. Um, for the past 10 years, MCB has been hosting this economic outlook uh, presentation, and we're happy and honored to bring back our speaker, uh, Dr. Terry Clower, director of the Center for Regional Analysis at George Mason University. I'll kick it off and turn it over to him in a moment, but just a couple of housekeeping items in advance. This presentation will run about 90 minutes. There'll be about a 20 minute Q&A following that. Um, you can submit your questions into the chat function. Janet Sub, a colleague at MCB, will be assembling those questions and she'll go through the Q&A with Dr. Clower at the end. Janet is a senior tax manager at MCB and uh, she will be the moderator for the rest of the presentation. Uh, and then lastly, housekeeping wise, there will be an email to you in the following weeks that will allow you to have a link to be able to access this presentation. So that being said, let me introduce our, our speaker, Dr. Terry Clower. As I said, he is the professor of public policy at George Mason University and the director of GMU's Center for Regional Analysis. Uh, Dr. Clower has been doing this presentation for us for seven or eight years now, and it's always a, a great kickoff to the new year, and we're super excited to have him back, and he's a great speaker. Those of you who have been part of it in the past already know that, and, and those who are joining for the first time, you're, you're in for a treat. So that being said, let me turn it over to Dr. Clower so he can provide us with insight in the, the uh, economic markets or the outlook for the economic uh, outlook for our region, as well as the country, as well as internationally. So Dr. Clower, it's all yours. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. It's uh, good to see a lot of folks uh, joining in for this. Uh, and we will be uh, just jumping right on in and talking about what's happening in the national and regional economy and, and some outlooks of what we expect for 2024. And then for the uh, regional, we're going to go out a little bit further and talk about some things that are challenging our region that we want to make you aware of for, for this coming year. So first of all, um, just looking at the nation overall, economic growth continues. Uh, we've been in the recovery mode, as you can see, kind of look at that. If you look at that green line with all the little dots on it and then sloping up, you know, upward and to the right, we certainly you see the impacts of the, of the uh, uh, recession that we had that was sparked by the pandemic and the business shutdowns. But what you can see is that we've just about, you know, come back to the trend line. We're, we're right at the level of where we would have been. And you'll notice that what's happened is in the last few quarters, the, the pace of growth has continued to accelerate. This has been a great surprise to many, including myself, because we expected with the degree to which the Federal Reserve increased interest rates, you know, moving base rates up dramatically after, you know, repeated uh, increases that that was going to shock the system. And in much respect, in many respects, that's what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to slow economic growth to tame down inflation that had been sparked by, by supply con chain constraints and other factors during the recession. Job market 
is the one that just, you know, it, it continues to surprise people to the upside. We added 216,000 jobs over the November to December period. Um, one of these days, and hopefully soon, I'll be able to take, you know, 2020 and say to 2022, just kind of wipe that out because it obviously distorts as we're looking at the variations and when we're trying to chart these data. Folks keep telling us they expected the job markets to slow down. In fact, if you'll recall, even last year, I was telling you that I expected that we could see a, a mild recession sometime in 2023, and uh, that did not happen. One thing that I will caution you about, though, is we start to see some weaknesses in some sectors of the economy, is that jobs are always a lagging indicator for a recession. The country, typically, if it goes into a recession, you will see job growth continuing in the early months of the recession, and then you will see that job growth won't resume until a month or two or three months after the recession effectively ends. It's just a job, you know, the labor market, it lags what's going on in the rest of it. And of course, the way we do the measurement of recession is always a look back hindsight um, and, you know, and, and it's, it's just one that the timing of that becomes kind of an almost arbitrary decision of announcing what quarter a recession starts. But still, job market has been uh, remarkably resilient and continues to be so, so far. But there are some, some measures here that are worth looking at. So there are three different pieces of data on this slide. The darker green in the upper chart is the unemployment rate. That's your headline rate. It's also called the U3 rate. That's your usual measure of unemployment we're all we're used to. And you'll note that we, we haven't had a whole lot of change in that rate over the last few months. Uh, and 3.7% is by measures, old traditional measures, that means pretty much full employment, and it would suggest that. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't folks who aren't looking for jobs, but you get structural unemployment just because people move from one job to next. Some, you know, businesses continue to be created and some businesses fail. So there's a natural churn, but that churn seems to be below at a national level, be maybe even somewhat below what we used to traditionally think of as being about 5% unemployment rate. The number up above that uh, in the somewhat lighter green shade is the U6 rate. Those That includes folks who are underemployed in the sense that they are working part-time, but would be rather working full-time. So we look at that gap and you'll notice that prior to the pandemic, that gap between the U6 and the U3 rate had been narrowing. And then of course it ballooned back up in the aftermath of the pandemic and been relatively stable um, for the most part. It's it improved a little bit over the last year, but uh, still that means that there are still folks out there in the marketplace that are technically underemployed. However, I would tell you that in my judgment, a lot of that at this point has as much to do with skills gaps as opposed to just labor availability. In many respects, the more important number is that one below labor force participation rate. Um, the labor force participation rate at, at you know prior pandemic, about 63%, was below what had been, say, the, the pre-global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. You know, that, that number was probably 65% or so uh, prior to that. So in some respects, our labor market never recovered from the Great Recession. And, you know, some of us will have had friends or family or somebody that you know, lost their jobs during the Great Recession. And then basically, you know, maybe they were old enough and they just retired early or whatever it was, they never came back. You'll see that the labor force participation rate, of course, plummeted during the, during the pandemic. Uh, that was much, there was a good hunk of that that had something to do with uh, child care and elder care and, you know, and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, people that were in sectors that required in-person contact, the hospitality industry and things and retail, other sectors that basically just didn't do so because they were scared to. You'll note that we've seen some improvements in that uh, labor force participation rate, particularly as the pandemic has been kind of declared over. We know that COVID is still out there, but of course it does not appear to be for most healthy people, the threat that it was when it first emerged. 
some of this gain that we've seen recently in 2023 seems to be largely women returning back to the workforce. But one of the key factors that remains a challenge is the issues of affordable child care and elder care. You know, child care in our region, and, and particularly, is just not affordable. And this is something that, that plagues many of our metropolitan areas. We can talk more about that in a little bit. If we look at where the jobs have been growing, uh, and these are sectors that are ranked by size, education and health services, the education component of that, uh, I will remind you, is private education. Uh, public education shows up in state and local government. Uh, so we, but there is a lot of this recovery has been in health services, professional and business services is up. The numbers that are in the red squares are comparing the employment count in thousands to February of 2020. So just prior to the pandemic setting in. And what you can notice, especially is if you go down to that leisure and hospitality line, about number four down the, the rankings, we see year over year, um, almost a half a million job growth, but we're still about 163,000 below pre-pandemic levels. And those of you that may be in the hospitality or retail trade and all know of how hard it has been to get workers to come back. Retail trade has actually softened in growth a good bit. It is above pre-pandemic levels, uh, but it has shown some indications of, of softening out and stabilizing. And of course, and some of that ties back to labor force availability. Those of you that are in retail trade know that you know it's a hard time. Well, all of us are having a hard time finding workers. As in my center, we have a hard time finding workers these days. Uh, manufacturing up some a little bit. Financial, we'll talk about that in a regional context. It's up a little bit, but some of that is... Uh, some of that is surprising at this point, uh, because I expect as the change in particularly mortgage interest rates and how that affects, you know, mortgage originations and, and refinance and all that, that's having a, an impact. And so especially in this region, we'll talk about that later. The, the ones that are uh, declining a little bit, transportation and utilities, that includes transportation there, includes uh, transportation and warehousing. And part of that is just simply that the online retail services, think Amazon, in the early days of the pandemic, they overgrew, they, they expanded too much. And so there's been some pullback to a more stable level of, of services and employment in those sectors. Information, those declines show the continual contraction that we've had in the publishing industry. Newspapers, things like that continue to contract. There is growth and other components of information services, but, but that is what's dominating that number. And you'll notice that federal government has grown on a national level over the last year. We will be talking about that, especially as we get to talk about the region. So earnings have been going up uh, as suggested by that um, upper line that you see there. Uh, you see that little blip up there about the uh, where in 20, just past 2020 and 2022, there was that little blip. That blip is actually fully caused by the disparities in who lost their jobs during the pandemic. It was retail hospitality workers who on average earn less money. And so average weekly earnings for the nation actually rose because who was losing their jobs was not evenly distributed across the uh, wage classes. Weekly earnings, by the way, just as a reminder for folks, that takes into account not only just your, your hourly wage, but how many hours per week you work. I find it a much better measure than just looking at wages, uh, but we do track it over there in the little box over there on the right to, to talk about that. The real notion, though, or the real important one is that while wages and earnings have been rising, when you adjust for inflation, that bottom line, you can see that we've actually been continuing to, to lose ground. Now, in the most uh, recent period, we actually picked up. We actually finally saw wages increase, uh, and that's because of, of one, wage increases and inflation has been moderating. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. Uh, but so there has been a little bit of growth in, in real wages recently, but the overall trend you can tell from that, that line just really 
has not been particularly positive. And this is the angst that you see even in politics now of households. There's a lot of households out there that just feel like that they're not in as good a shape as they they were uh, prior to the pandemic and the numbers would suggest they're correct. Groceries and everything else are higher. Labor productivity has received a lot of attention. Um, I've had folks that talked about that like to talk about that when workers started working remotely, that they started sloughing off and not doing anything. Well, the, the numbers don't suggest that. In fact, I would say with, with most of us and our staffs, you'd say that we wound up working harder or longer because we weren't commuting and, thing, you know, and things like that for those of us that had the ability to work from home. Uh, you see those drops that we had that was very concerning. And I would tie that somewhat to the stresses that were kind of mounting up during the pandemic and with the rising prices, um, it was very much one of seeing changes in worker mental health. We did an analysis for the Northern Virginia uh, Community Foundation uh, last summer, looking at this and the, the Census Bureau during the course of the pandemic started doing what they called a pulse survey and they were asking workers about how they were feeling, their mental health, or were they stressed, were they depressed, whatever it might be, and, and to grade it, and then also ask them how, they, how the worker felt it was impacting their work performance. We took that information and came up with a new method of trying to evaluate that, and part of what we were doing is just allowing that, as you might all imagine, if you have a coworker that is not performing as, much as they used to, they're not as productive. You know, for a while, the team kind of picks up the slack. So, you know, it's not just, you know, it's not just a matter, you have to allow that there's, you know, that there's back and forth in that. But of course, over time, if the worker continues to have challenges performing, you start stressing the other workers. Just to give you a sense, our estimate that for Northern Virginia is that during 2022, we lost about $8 billion worth of output uh, to labor force productivity challenges. Good news is that the measures have started to come back. Productivity is always, of course, a challenge because as technologies come in, do our measures of productivity fully allow for that? Now, at the moment, you know, something like artificial intelligence, I'm not sure if that's contributing to productivity or contributing to us uh, creating cute little uh, generative uh, Photoshop things that probably detract from our work performance, but over time we would expect that some of these new technologies are going to dramatically change office work productivity, hopefully for the better. Consumers uh, are their present situation, uh, as I mentioned, they continue to be somewhat downbeat compared to what they were prior to the pandemic, but those numbers obviously have come up dramatically, but you can see that there are stresses you get a couple of factors going on. One is prices are still high. When you go to the grocery store, you, when we're taming inflation, doesn't mean that, that prices on eggs and bananas and everything else are dropping a lot. Uh, it's that, you know, it's just that prices are still comparatively high to what we remember that they were four years ago. And that creates some stress. And of course, now in this uh, political season that we have, you know, you've got you've got the politicians there out that want you to believe that things are just horrible and the country's falling apart, and that's part of their political agenda. So the messaging to the general public gets pretty negative during presidential election years, depending on which party, of course, you're supporting. The expectations index has dropped somewhat, and that tends to affect larger purchases over time, but so far we haven't really seen an operational impact of that. Uh, it, it's one that we would expect that if, you're, if your expectations, how you think your personal household conditions, financial conditions are gonna be doing six months from now, if you're really concerned, you're probably not gonna go buy a new car or a new refrigerator. Well, you know, car sales have actually slowed a little bit, but things like refrigerators and other big ticket items continue to, uh, continue to move up. So let's look at prices for just a moment. Uh, we are getting closer to uh, having more normal levels of inflation. Remember that the Federal Reserve targets uh, their particular uh, measure of inflation that's a little bit different than this one, but it, it tracks very closely. Uh, they want to see two to two and a half percent. 
So we're down now to around 3.4%. That, that's a month over year basis. And that looks a lot better than what we were seeing. However, as I think I told you guys last year, I very much expect that last, you know, one to half percentage points of getting us from, you know, say a 3.4 or a 3.2% down to a two and a half percent is going to be a lot harder than we than a lot of folks think. If for no reason, think about this. We are starting to, those wages that we were looking at earlier. Think about some of the deals that are being done now for the auto workers and others that are getting substantial pay raises as part of new labor agreements, which will influence other wages in non-union shops. So we will see wages increasing and at some point that gets that has to get passed through into prices. So I think that this last bit of getting down the inflation down is going to be a real challenge. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment about what that means for Fed actions. Producer price index looks even better. We actually on a month over month basis had disinflation uh, show up a little bit, uh, but it is um, we're still seeing that being dominated by oil prices that are remarkably constrained, given the turmoil that is uh, emerging in the Middle East over the last several months. Uh, gasoline prices are big down. Notice though that the service prices still are a little bit uh, inflated. Now that's not bad at this point, but I track the producer price index pretty closely as you know they got the leading indicator of where prices are going to go for consumers and i think that we will see continued downward pressure but again um i i can't help but think that with now with the attacks in the red sea from the houthi rebels and others that we're going to see oil prices and other internationally traded commodity prices uh, starting to rise just because of turmoil in the Middle East and then these actions that are starting to impede on the shipping of products and services. Interest rates, well, we know what the Fed has been doing, you know, just, you know, dramatically in increasing their rates. Uh, the market, you, you turn on any, whether it's CNBC or Bloomberg or anybody else, you, if you're reading anything in the, in the business press and the financial press now, you know, it seems that the market is really baking in that the Fed is going to start cutting rates. Um, I think that is not a fair bet to make at the moment. Uh, I think they will pause. I do believe that rates are going to come down some in this coming year. I just don't think it's going to happen in March, for example. Uh, now, maybe I'm wrong and maybe they do a quarter uh, quarter basis point kind of move, but I or 25 point basis point move a uh, quarter of an interest of a point of interest. I don't, though, I, I think at this point they're too scared of repeating the, the problems of the 1970s where in flighting inflation, the Fed backed off too quickly, um, but we will see. Uh, treasuries are stable. We still see some inverted, uh, that's problematic. And of course we're rewriting the book on what the inverted yield curve means in terms of the direction of the overall economy. We've never seen circumstances quite like this. Uh, 30 year mortgages, um, they they have certainly have peaked up a little, uh, and you know you're you're approaching now uh, close to seven percent in uh, this last period that we had for late December. Um, I think they will moderate some, but I do not expect mortgage rates to fall below six percent or even maybe six and a quarter percent, uh, except maybe just you know little dips here or there. But I think it's going to stay relatively elevated. The other piece of that though has to be that 6% range mortgage rates is more along historic norms. In fact, you know, it's for many of us, we can think of times when we've held mortgages when 6% would have been a very attractive rate. So I think we're getting somewhat where people are being acculturated to the higher interest rates. And we are seeing then housing purchase activity starting to rebound now. But it's it's just really interesting because I'm wondering about expectations of these new home buyers. Are they expecting that they're going to have to pay you know six percent now, 
and they're going to get to refinance to three and a half or four percent or three percent, you know, in a year from now or two years from now, I think those days are kind of gone for the foreseeable future. And so I hope that folks aren't betting too much of their financial uh, condition on the assumption that they will be able to, in a year or two, refinance their mortgages at a much, much lower rate than what they're having now. One of the other reasons that I think uh, interest rates are going to continue to stay a little bit elevated for longer, so I am among the higher for longer crowd, if you want to think of it that way, is that while the Fed is starting to wind down their positions that they built up during the various phases of quantitative easing, there's a long way to go to go back to some kind of a, a normal condition. I mean, just think about, I mean, look at what we were holding, you know, the num that, that those numbers on the y-axis here are trillions of dollars. And so we have, uh, we have where, I mean, the Fed can, can pause at any point, but they are shedding assets and that is putting a lot of bonds and other similar products on the market. And of course, as you know, if you increase the supply of these money products out there, then you have to offer a higher interest rate to attract an, a buyer. So we've got a little bit of a countervailing influence going on here. And as long, and, but having said that, we really, really, really need the Federal Reserve to unwind these assets down to a more stable level, because what if something else happens, an external shock, the Middle East turns into a full scale regional or, you know, broadly regional war, the stuff spreads from Ukraine or something or China and Taiwan, whatever, it, any kind of external event that would shock our economy, one could argue that the Federal Reserve doesn't have a lot of arrows left in its quiver to help protect our economy from a severe, severe downturn. So we hope that, that they will continue this mode of, of reducing debt levels. New home sales, uh, obviously, um, back and forth, the new homes are in the, the blue and you'll see that you, know, you had that major drop off as interest rates for mortgages increased dramatically uh, in 2022 and, and that part, but you'll notice that it's, it's risen back again. There have been some recent uh, downturns, but overall we are seeing some positive signs in new home sales markets. The existing home sales have plummeted and continue to drop. And a lot of that, of course, is people who love their current mortgage. I mean, if you have a 2.7, 2.5%, you know, 30-year mortgage or a 2%, 15-year mortgage, why the heck would you think about moving to another home where you're going to get a six and a half to seven percent mortgage? It just, you know, it makes no financial sense to put some framing on that uh, of what it could mean. A colleague of mine, Lisa Sturdivant, who is the chief economist for Bright MLS, did an analysis, and it's a little bit dated at this point, but she was comparing Arlington median home prices in August of 2022 to August of 2023, and I believe that between the increase in pricing of housing and the increase in the interest on mortgage rates, the difference in monthly payment amounted to a 44% higher mortgage payment each month. So if you think about how that would stress households. So the, the idea of existing home sales dropping down is no great surprise. And I just don't see that changing much under the current mortgage rate environment. So what's the outlook for the US? Well, certainly we're going to have uh, challenges with interest rates. I am very concerned about reserve requirements that the federal government is considering place. We certainly had a few bank failures. And if you look even, even just at the surface, you can tell that that was a regulatory oversight issue, that these, these banks were operating really irresponsibly if you get down to it. And so it was a matter of that the regulators didn't top in. To say that they're going to use that as a reason to tighten reserve requirements among banks is going to have a ripple effect through the rest of the economy that's going to tamp down business expansion, business development, just because the, the banks are going to not be lending. It won't be a matter of what the interest rates are. Um, 
Now, of course, the other side is interest rates are certainly higher now, and that gap between what's being paid and what's uh, on deposits versus what's being paid uh, on loans or what's being charged on loans, I should say, that's obviously having an impact on business expansion and really hurting new entrepreneurs coming trying to come into the marketplace. Consumer spending, I think, is going to slow. We've seen some uh, some weaknesses or whatever, whatever the excess savings that had been built up during the pandemic that we've been living off of for a couple of years now is pretty much gone. Very well-to-do households still have pent up pandemic savings, but the very well-to-do don't can't drive the whole economy. Inflation is still mattering about the high level prices, even as prices come down. And then, of course, the other is that simply because there's not as many housing units on the market, there's not as many new homeowners. And as those of you that have bought or moved, you know, any time in recent history will acutely remember is how much money we spend that spends off of moving from one house to the next. You know, the furniture is no longer right. The window treatments aren't what you want, whatever the case may be new home buying and even existing home buying creates lots and lots of spinoff activity. And we just see that overall level of sales and home sales dropping and that having an impact. We're also seeing, of course, indications that consumers are becoming higher stress. I mean, you think about it, the average, um, average FICO score consumer right now, if they're taking on credit card debt, they're being charged 25, 26% interest, which is just you know, unfathomable about how households can survive if they're having to pay that much. Overall for the US, I think we'll continue to see positive job gains, maybe up about one and a half million jobs for the year, uh, but the gap between labor demand and labor supply will continue to narrow. I think we could still see the chances of a slowdown. I've taken recession off of my forecast for 2024, uh, but I do think that we'll still see the market. I still got to believe that the textbooks that I was trained on are right and the Fed actions will slow the economy more than what we've seen so far. It just takes a while for those things to take a, to have an impact. And that's been historically true. And just think of the number of increases that the that the feds have done on top of each other, not waiting for the previous rate increase to take hold in the marketplace. Stock market, I mean, right now, you know, you, you get your thing that depend on when you measure it, but it looks like a little down. I think there's going to be a lot of volatility. I think you're going to see where some of the trader expectations in terms of Fed actions and what's happening in the market are, are going to see some disappointment. I think you're going to see some challenging uh, numbers coming out of some corporate earnings expectations as they're seeing the consumers get a little more stressed. Uh, I, and of course, then as profits are also going to be hit as labor costs escalate for some of these as they've had to attract and retain good workers. Largely, I think that you'll just see a lot of volatility. Overall, I expect maybe the, the market will be up some, but I'm not expecting this to be, you know, one of your big, you know, big bull market opportunities. I just don't see that developing in 2024 overall. Private development, uh, you know, we're seeing indications, interestingly, where because of things like the infrastructure bill and the bill that, that um, the Biden administration got passed through Congress to support the expansion of the chip industry in this nation. Some of that is leading to construction activities and it's actually pushing out some other private investment development activities because simply the contracting firms don't have enough construction labor to do both jobs. So they, they're taking the one that's tied to the chip making plants or some of this other infrastructure spending. Um, we are going to see, you know, I'm, I am hoping that the conditions in Ukraine and Middle East are more about stagnation than deterioration. I don't see quick resolutions to either one of those conflicts at the, at the moment. I can, I can be hopeful, but I'm just not, uh, quite frankly. GDP is, uh, for the year, I think will be up 1.9%, uh, slower growth. I could think that we'd see maybe some contraction in the third quarter, but it won't be enough to spark an official definition of a recession. So moving into the DC region, there is a 
an organization called Greater Greater Washington that's been here for a long time. And I have a message for you today that is not particularly optimistic, not particularly positive, but not one that I'm expressing doom and gloom. So, you know, remember that I, I'm an economist, I practice the dismal science, but it's one that, that I'm calling attention to some real building challenges that we all need as business people and business leaders to be concerned about. So my tagline here is that the Washington region was great, it can be greater, but if we do nothing, we will be on a path dependent model towards perpetual economic mediocrity. So fit that into your next cocktail hour conversation, perpetual economic mediocrity. What do I mean by that? Well, we look at gross domestic product in the US versus what's happened in the Washington metro area. Now, normally folks, I would be presenting this in real GDP numbers. Uh, and I had a slide that was prepared early and we found that uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, where we get this uh, data from the Fred database, they actually had a mistake. They had nominal and real data blended into the same uh, spreadsheet. So uh, we, we sent the notice on that and have not seen a correction yet on that one. So I'm speaking of this in, in nominal terms, which means that all of those percentage increases are inflated, but the ratios, the relevant numbers are, are valid. So in the in the two, early 2000s, we were growing a lot faster uh, than the U.S. on average. Uh, this is these are compounded uh, growth average rates over the over the five year periods. Uh, the in the period of time that included the worst of the Great Recession because of the underpinning of the federal government, we outperformed the nation. But then after that, you notice that we've started to trail the nation in growth. Now, I'm gonna give you uh, one stat that in real terms, the growth in the last year for the US, uh, and I'm looking at 2022, which is the last year for which we have data at the regional level, the US grew at about 1.9%. The Washington region grew at 1.9%. So we've come back. Well, there's a big asterisk that I put on that. If I take out the gross product contributions of building data centers in 2022 that occurred in Loudoun County alone, that regional growth rate goes from 1.9% to 0.7%. So basically, if you consider what's happened in Fairfax County to a lesser degree, more of what's happened uh, in Prince William County, I can say that all of our growth can be attributed to a very narrow sector of our economy, data centers, and one that we're seeing now emerging political pushback, like in Prince William County, of folks saying, we don't want any more of that, which of course, given the dynamics of that, I don't understand at all. I'll give you a little stat. In both Loudoun and Prince William County, and I'll round out the numbers so they sound about the same, is that for every dollar the city spends on providing services to the data center industry, they get $13 in tax revenues back. There is no other sector in our economy that is giving that kind of a return to localities. It is the data centers that in these communities that have them that are helping to provide for, you know, solid education services and other public services. They are a net massive contributor to it. I can appreciate that if you, you know, live next door to one, we probably need to do a better job about design standards. There needs to be better jobs and the rules now allow for much better, um, much better rules about buffers between data centers and residential properties than they were in the first few years. But to say that we don't want any more of that, I promise you there are other areas of the country, including places like Columbus, Ohio, as well as uh, places in the South and Southwest and the West Coast, they want those businesses. So we we just can't get into a deal of you know deciding, hey, we don't want any more of you guys. Now we are seeing the data centers are spreading out to others. Stafford County, where I live now, has recently approved a, a new one, but you, you get the point is that, that what we have seen over time 
and particularly over the last 10 years, we are just not performing as well as we were. Now jobs overall for the region, uh, we have uh, recovered from the pandemic as of about November of 2022. So we've, you know, for well over a year, we've topped that. Uh, year over year, we've seen uh, the region about 48,000 uh, job growth. November is the most recent data that we have for that. It takes a little bit of additional lag versus the national data to get these points. Uh, but you can see that the growth, you know, we had the big loss um, during the pandemic. We recovered sharply. And then that uh, growth is moved. on average, this region long term does pretty well with about 50,000 growth. Uh, 50,000 annual job growth. That's kind of where we're at. I'll compare that to some place like the Dallas Fort Worth area that for better part of a decade has been averaging 100,000 uh, growth. If we look at this across the different sectors, so professional and business services, which of course a lot of our, that represents a lot of our contractors, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, we've actually seen a little recent weakness in that sector, uh, though we are still up compared to, again, what it was pre-pandemic in the little red box. Uh, education and health services are up. Federal government is actually, uh, it's down in the region recently. We're still above pandemic, but I understand that there was that volatility that was going on, and I, I'll, I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, you'll note down there the financial services about three quarters of the way down the list. Uh, that's where we're seeing the effects of uh, locally our mortgage lenders and the mortgage originators and brokers and stuff like that. That has come down quite a bit and we are and we are continuing to see consolidation in retail banking where mergers and acquisitions and just simply consolidation of branch bank locations has been going on. Federal government is, is down. Uh, more recently, you can see these, these movements back and forth. And of course, the biggest dips that you see there were during the height of budget sequestration and the Budget Control Act. I uh, don't know what will happen if, you know, certainly if you take some of the most conservative folks in the Republican Party, if next year's election were to put the Republicans back in charge of the House and Senate and the administration, I guarantee you that we'll have something like a Budget Control Act again will emerge. And of course, that was, um, that was certainly a problem for our regional economy. But still, we're seeing this trend. The piece that I want to do here, though, is draw your attention on a different way of looking at this data over time, where we say, okay, let's just compare back to February of 2020, so prior to the pandemic, where we are with federal employment, U.S. versus D.C., and you'll see that big, you know, that big increase in there during the pandemic where you had the government programming, but note that in the last year, we've seen kind of a crossover where federal government employment is expanding more elsewhere in the country. One of the reasons that I think for this is a labor issue. We are told anecdotally, not officially, by some of the agency heads that they are really challenged with finding workers in this region. If you're managing a federal agency department, you get an authority to hire. But that authority to hire comes with a time limit. If you don't act upon that, if you don't get the person in place within a certain timeline, that authority is automatically withdrawn. And what they're telling us is they are having a hard time finding workers at the skill sets that they need to fill who are willing to move to this region for a federal wage. They're happy to work for the federal government, but they won't move to the DC region at our housing costs and our other cost of living. And that's impacting. So that means that you have, even though the government would prefer, these government departments would prefer that worker to be local, they're hiring them remotely just because that's what the market is demanding that they do if they actually want to place those positions. Let's look at professional business services. So this is where uh, you see most of the contractors in our region. This is where that gets reflected. And overall, that number has weakened dramatically in the latter part of this year. And you can see that bounce back, but look at look how we're looking now, even all of this year, 
compared to the historic trends as we were coming out of budget sequestration back in 2013 and 14. I'm going to break this down a little bit more, and you've seen this before, where the green bars are things like lawyers, accountants, computer programmers, architects, engineers. The yellow band represents folks that are, say, temporary personnel agencies, building services, waste management. So you can see that it was really those folks that got hammered as we shut businesses down during the pandemic. Uh, largely, we stayed fairly stable in the professional services sector. Then as the recovery happened, you see this, but you'll notice that here recently, with a couple of little indications of positive trends here or there, we've really seen some negative trends happening in the professional business services. Let's again now compare that to the US overall. And you can see that green line is, is DC indexed again to February, 2020. And you can see that it's you know, a little above on an index level, but tracking very much with the US. But then as of about two, you know, post pandemic, the rest of the countries, you know, after getting hit pretty hard, took a really aggressive growth rate and we're just falling behind. Um, while this is going on, federal spending levels by all indications in this region are staying strong and staying pretty high. So what's concerning is that our traditional correlation between rising government spending and an increase in professional and technical services employment seems to be breaking down a little bit, which again suggests that are the contractors simply becoming that much more efficient real quickly, or are they starting to fill those positions out of employment that's elsewhere, other offices located elsewhere in the country? Just a quick note on how things are going in the, in the regions. You can see that di the district is, um, it's growing, but it still is uh, substantially about 20,000 jobs below pre-pandemic levels. You can see that they, by the green line, that they have not recovered yet. And things have really stagnated, I think, in the district. And I mean, there's lots of reasons and we can talk about those reasons in the Q&A session if you want, but there are a lot of things that are not particularly positive about what's happening in the district. And similarly, though not as bad, suburban Maryland has not recovered to pre-pandemic employment levels yet, which then suggests that where is the action? Northern Virginia. And our track lines, we're still a little bit below long-term trend line, but we're doing better, but we're not doing as well as we would like to do. So remember I was saying that job growth is somewhat constrained in, uh, in suburban Maryland. Look at their unemployment rate. 1.7%, Northern Virginia, 2.6%. For goodness sakes, the District of Columbia is now below 5% unemployment rate. Our challenge here is simply a matter of worker availability. You can't add jobs if you don't have people to hire or people who you know match up with the skill sets that you're needing. So let's look at the labor force trends. Like elsewhere, the labor force um, dipped down during the pandemic and has been recovering, but again, we're not back up to that trend line. Sorry for the dog barking in the background. How dare another dog walk down our street? Um, but here's an interesting stat. I want, I want to call very close attention to how I have structured the y-axis. Remember, those of us that do data, we can tell different stories by how we structure the y-axis, but in a relatively short period, the proportion of the regional labor force that's in Northern Virginia, as opposed to the district or suburban Maryland, has gone up about two percentage points of total. That is, in labor market terms, an incredibly fast shift. So there is, there is some real stuff going on here. And what it suggests is that the labor force in the region are, in some respects, voting with their feet. But then let's challenge, let's look at this long term then. How are we doing against other metro areas? And you really start to see some differences. So we're running about the same as Boston, a little bit better than Minneapolis, a little bit better than you know, San Francisco with its you know, pricing and New York City with its pricing. But look at you know, something like Austin or Dallas. Austin has 46% more workers 
than they had 10 years ago as of October or so. You know, I mean, you just, this is where the dynamics of the labor market is and the constraints that we are having in job growth, I think are explained by this, uh, this slide. Now, of course, then the question becomes why? Here's the other manifestation of that. You've seen this data from us before. Uh, this is measuring population change that comes out of the Census Bureau. The last period uh, that this is a little bit of an odd data set in that the 12 months that they measure is from July of 2021 to June of 2022. Here in another month, uh, about two months from now, we'll get the uh, 22 to 23 numbers. But just look at that, you know, domestic out migration has been happening for quite a while, but has been accelerating post pandemic and continuing on. I have been shown other data that I wasn't given the day, but I've been shown other data that um, would indicate that using financial records like credit applications and stuff like that, that what is happening now in the in say 2023 period is that our youngest cohort of workers we're not losing as much, we're about balance. So domestic migration is you know about zero, not growing, but at least not losing. But we continue to lose workers in that 30 to 50 cohort, 30 age, 30 to 50 age cohort. And so this is telling us that folks, when they start forming families and start needing to really think about housing and the size of housing they need and services like childcare services and stuff like that are choosing, again, to use the term voting with their feet, they're leaving the region. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but looking at that data, where is it concentrated? We're seeing a little bit of the out migration effect even within the region, Fairfax County, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, losing the most folks. Where are we seeing some gains? Well, you look, Stafford, Charles, Spotsylvania, and the big winner, Frederick, uh, up in Maryland. So you see that basically we're seeing that some of the folks leaving at least are stopping while they're still in the metropolitan area, but others are going farther away. Let's explore. And just to give you some sense, how do Fairfax and Montgomery County look among the largest counties in the, in the country, counties that have a population of at least a million? Well, we're doing better than some. What's interesting about this is that Kings, Queens, and Bronx uh, all lost, but New York County, which is, of course, Manhattan, uh, is not among the big losers. That was an interesting little thing. Northern California, Santa Clara, and Alameda, Philadelphia, then Fairfax, then Chicago, then Montgomery County. On the other side, if we look at the point at the positive side of that ledger, most of those counties, Collin County is a northern, is just north of Dallas County in the in North Texas, uh, where Plano and Frisco and those kind of towns are, if you've heard of those. Most of those uh, counties that are on the positive side of the le ledger here are in Florida and Texas. There's a few scattered elsewhere. This takes a little bit different look at what's going on. This is LinkedIn members. So I'm thinking of this as representing more of the uh, educated technical class, so white collar workers, because that's the, you know, LinkedIn is the professional um, social media contract. The Y axis here are the same in these. Who are coming here? Well, I'll give you all a guess. Look at where they're coming from. What does that have in common? All of these are big college towns. And so we have the young workers getting out of school and coming here, though I would tell you that my impression from talking to folks in government and elsewhere, that it's not nearly the rate that used to come here. The whole notion of government service is not as appealing to the current generation of youngest workers that we have. But then look at the other side of the ledger and one, compare the top 10 just in terms of the rate of migration and then look where they're going. Now that first one, I think is surprising, uh, Los Angeles. But let's set that aside for a moment. Tampa Bay, Dallas, Denver, Charlotte, Richmond, you can see that and you're just thinking about where it's going. So let's do a little comparison to some things that may help. So Los Angeles, if you look at the uh, table on the left versus the one on the right is the local stuff. So as a region, our uh, housing costs figure in at about 2.5% or I'm sorry, 2.5 times the national average. Uh, Los Angeles is a little below that, but comparable. So maybe it's just a matter that if cost of living is gonna be about the same, 
then um, gee, maybe being close to the beach is worth something. I mean, who would ever want to leave our region with our great warm weather, our easy commutes and our laid back lifestyle? I mean, why would you ever want to leave here, right? I say with tongue firmly planted in cheek, but then look at Tampa, Dallas, Charlotte, and particularly like Charleston, Orlando, families can leave here and experience much lower cost of living. And what it becomes quite frankly, is that trade-off between amenities and cost of living. Because the thing that I will tell you folks is that if you look at some of these, Charlotte, Tampa Bay, Miami, Charleston, a lot of these cities, they have great amenities. Dallas, Atlanta, Nashville, some that aren't necessarily on this list, they've grown up a lot in the last 20 years, 25 years, and they have great amenities, cultural amenities things that are attractive. They have neighborhoods with different kind of housing and different kind of community feels from, you know, even stuff that looks like row housing, townhomes, to condos, to single family homes. And so we're losing out on the amenities versus cost of living measures, I think. And part of this is driven by inventories of existing homes. Look at that long run trend. We are just continually losing our ability to have housing for the for the workforce or for anybody for that matter, but especially workforce housing and housing that is affordable to young professional families for what they want. You know, we'll assume that a young professional family can't afford to pay $1.2 million for a bungalow in Arlington. And even more than that, if they want to be in the district. So we move this, we we see this continual pressure on inventories in the market. In fact, when I do work for the Northern Virginia Association Realtors and we do our housing forecast, I mean, we've started talking, you know, these meetings that we have when I look at the numbers and then review them with some of the, the folks that are business leaders in different areas of, of uh, residential real estate. It, it's kind of like singing in the limbo, you know, how low can you go? Uh, and it really is. We just get, keep getting surprised at how tight it becomes. And of course, now where you have folks that are sitting on their two and a half percent 30 year mortgage, they're, they're not moving. If they do move, they're probably going to keep the house and turn it into a rental property. And so I'm really concerned about the inventory of for sale homes, because the one thing about our tax policies is that we still the, 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 the deals with being able to deduct mortgage interest rates and all makes home ownership still one of the best paths for most folks, most average folks to be able to build wealth, particularly intergenerational wealth. And so if we take away home ownership as an option, but that home ownership options are available in other metro areas across the South, out West, wherever it may be, that's going to be a challenge for us to retain those workers. A little note here about the existing home sales and that, that downturn. I think it's interesting to even think about the impacts this has had in the real estate market. So my back of the envelope calculation is that we're taking this year because of reduced number of sales, which means that Realtors don't get a commission, which means that brokers uh, don't get another activity on a mortgage, all of that. Just thinking about the commissions on sales, if we take the average prices and we look at this downturn in the number of sales, I figure we're losing about 40 to $50 million a year uh, per month in realtor income. And then that spreads around. So we could be talking easily about 75 to 100 dollars, 100, I'm sorry, 75 to 100 million dollars per month coming out of local economic activity just because of the reduced number of sales because of inventory challenges that we see in the market. Average home prices uh, continue to go up. Look at that on this chart here, the black line and how toward the end of 2022, it kind of leveled out for a bit. That had a lot to do with the increase in mortgage rates 
but look at what's been happening after about the mid part of this of uh, 2023 gone right back up that shock value of mortgages rising very quickly by 300 basis points or so uh we're getting over that shock and fo and with the inventory levels you have it now this also speaks to the challenge of overall housing supply beyond just the for sale we just simply aren't building enough housing we haven't been building enough housing for well over a decade now in fact you know and so it's just it is just really really challenging out there for us to find work uh, find housing for our workforce and if you think about trying to attract people to move from elsewhere to come here think of the story if they're if they're coming here with you know with uh, uh, two parents and two kids in the household think about what you need to pay those folks to where they can live a good lifestyle here compared to maybe some of the other parts of the country maybe it looks attractive versus new york maybe it looks attractive versus being in in san francisco but then both of those cities have other things whether it's the the whole vibe of being in New York City or the sense that if you're in the tech sector, there's still probably no place better to be than out in Silicon Valley, Northern California area. So you, you just think about that, that we're just in a challenging position. So what's my outlook? Federal spending. Um, I think we are past the peak and we'll see that it's going to drop off some now with the pandemic programs have there are winding down over the next year or two, but we do see things like the infrastructure investment act and others they will keep it up. I still think that we're past peak for our region, but it's still going to be robust federal spending is still there underpinning our economy. Consumer spending, I think, is going to be retail as though it's, it's ticked up a little bit I think overall if you think about it it's it's got to be. And when I say slow down, downward trend, that may be a little bit harsh. I think it's going to flatten out and may trend a little down because simply we have a lot of folks that have accumulated big, expensive credit card debt now. And we're starting to see some pain with delinquencies on credit card debts, delinquencies on some higher cost auto loans, things like that are starting to, to emerge. So I think that consumer spending in the region is going to be somewhat constrained. And then with the increase in house prices, rents have stabilized a little bit for those that are in the rental markets, but I could see them starting to tick upwards again. So I think the consumers are going to be in some kind of stress here. Uh, Congress functional well we're now you know trying to take it down to the wire for this next one and it looks like they're not you know they're going to wind up doing a uh, continuing resolution so do we wind up with a whole year of continuing resolutions and then of course there are sub-regional effects to spending priorities for example you know the difference of whether you're spending on social programs and NIH and stuff like that, which typically goes more to Maryland suburbs, or are you talking about more defense spending, more security spending, which typically goes more to Northern Virginia, those kind of differences. And of course, is Congress functional? Not by any rational dis measure is Congress functional, uh, full stop. It's just how bad is the dysfunction going to get? Well, I think it will get worse in this election year, particularly as it seems like the way the polls are shaping up now. Housing rents, I noted, are stabilized, but home ownership is out of reach for a good hunk of our workforce. And I'm not even thinking about affordable, low income housing. I'm talking about folks who have middle income jobs. We do have a talented workforce, the most talented in the country still by education, but many are moving out and the fact of the matter is is even though the ha the labor market has softened a little bit in this region there are still more than a hundred thousand posted job vacancies in our market that folks just can't find anybody with the skill sets or the work skill sets they need not just technical skills but work skill sets knowing how to show up knowing how to write a memo or to write a report whatever it may be those are all challenges that we're facing in our education system as well as in our labor market local government finances uh 
gosh, the whole thing with the fiscal cliff for WMATA, them asking for $750 million a year to keep the lights on, um, in addition to whatever, you know, this is new money. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a real challenge for me. Um, and I'll speak more to that in just a moment. The office, we got, um, we have historic levels of office vacancy rates in some of our communities. Earlier, I was talking about growth being constrained in this region as measured by regional product. Arlington in 2022 was technically in recession for the year. Their average growth over 2022 was a negative 0.2%. Um, so we have some real strain going on in our localities. The district, as you read about, uh, and I don't see that trend um, reversing anytime soon. So all of that stuff where you have the vacancy rates, you can bet that the building owners are going to local government and asking for reductions in their appraisal valuations. I would be if I were them because the market is suggesting you cannot command the rents. Now rents, interestingly enough, on class A trophy class properties are pretty stable. We are seeing somewhat of an increase in the incentives and giveaways are part of signing a lease are offered, but class B and class C office spaces are just dogs at this moment. Um, business lending, I, I mentioned before that I'm worried about the federal regulations uh, constraining business lending, but we have banks in our region that have as much uh, as 85% of their loan portfolios are in commercial offices. And so if they've got the wrong mix of class B versus trophy class properties, we could see some stresses. Now, most of the banks seem to be in pretty good shape, but there are a few that are gonna be really constrained. So a little bit, go back to 1980 is in the savings and loan crisis that was sparked by you know, office demand changes or, or imbalance of supply because of the whole thing about passive activity loss deductibility, as many of you will remember very well. Um, Return to office has stalled. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, home, or, home ownership now has shifted. We've seen some of that to where folks have moved to Stafford and Fauquier and uh, Frederick and all that. And those folks are not going to willingly come back to the office five days a week. And indeed, um, I mentioned this before, but the you know the, the the numbers tell us that the Fortune 100 are kind of just adapted to hybrid workforce for some of those for some of those folks. So the calls to force everybody back to the office, yeah. I do agree with Mayor Bowser and, and, and other leaders that are saying, you know, okay, federal government, get off your butts and start making some decisions. If, you know, of course, at this point, the federal workforce is just, you know, kind of defying what their bosses are telling them. And I think we, we, I think that's a bad thing, but it's like, figure out what the base level of need for offices is and start turning those properties over to the district so they can, you know, either do conversions where that makes sense. Rarely will that make sense, but we need to get that to where it's in productive use instead of just being empty, vacant, practically vacant federal office structures. We, we, you know, feds need to, the GSA, General Services Administration, has got to start just quit sitting on your hands and adapt that the workplace has shifted. It shifted faster than anybody thought, but it's a part of a long run trend. I have told you folks before that prior to the pandemic in this region, companies were telling me that to attract and retain younger workers, they were already going to hybrid work models where you have your head down time that you do some of your design work or other things, work that you need to be on, you do as likely to do that as home. And then you have collaboration days because we do know that on average, we do better when we have face-to-face -face collaborations and you get that water cooler innovation if you wanna think of it that way. But that doesn't mean that all of that has to be dependent on being in an office five days a week. We just maybe are working different now. So summation for this year, I see that the region will grow, will not fall into recession, um, but that job growth is gonna slow to maybe 20 to 30. And I think that's actually gonna be more front loaded in the first half of the year and that job growth could slow and become basically flat uh, in the last quarter of this year. 
And, and some of this just depends on the responses and what the Fed does and all of that. If the Fed starts dropping interest rates, that might spark a little bit, but we have greater challenges. And those challenges, as I note, are more about attracting and retaining talent to this region. If we do not fix that challenge and some other competitive issues that we're facing, then we are indeed, I think, on to a path of mediocrity. Now, keep in mind, we're not going to become Detroit, you know, who lost 50% of their population over a 30-year period. We are talking about still having the federal government underpinning what we are doing and therefore providing a floor to our economy. But we like to think of ourselves as better. We are the smartest folks. We think of ourselves as the most talented, as the, the best people to be running the country and running businesses and all of that. And now we're faced with an opportunity to actually change the way to do we do things, proving that we remain the best. Because the under because the federal government is just not going to be the whole source of growth as we move forward. That, that that's kind of simple. But then what can we do about it? So I've called all these challenges. I'm throwing out these this this negative message, trying to, in some respects, scare some folks into some action. Um, what are we going to do about it? Well, we are at the Center for Regional Analysis working on a series of research projects that will be coming out over the next 12 to 18 months that will be doing much to provide data to support positions and to be looking for best practices and new ways of thinking about the way we do things. So first of all, things that measure, how are we as an innovation economy? And keep in mind that innovation, I think of two or three different perspectives. There's process innovation, there's product innovation. We are actually not bad at services-based, process-based innovation, but we are not successful at all on average in this region about product innovation. And the key point there is product innovation is higher value added. You're creating a product. You attract more venture capital. You attract more angel investment with that. And product innovation typically results in higher job growth than process innovation. Let me illustrate something about process innovation. Now, for those of you that are technologists, you'll recognize that I'm, I'm probably overstating the case a little bit, but let's take artificial intelligence. There's a lot of things artificial intelligence can do pretty well now, you know, and you think about some of the generative AI products now that can take a photo and do all sorts of things with it. Can't, yeah, I've tried it, it can't make me look any better, but it can do great things. So we can see all of that, but what can artificial intelligence do pretty well? And that's predictive decision, predictive rule-based decision-making, right? If this, then this, then this, than this, right? Well, how much of the federal bureaucracy are people who are using federal rules and guidelines in rule-based decision-making? What if five years from now, we are employing artificial intelligence to make federal government more efficient, which I firmly believe we should, but the net effect of that is that instead of 370,000 workers earning about $110,000, $120,000 a year on average working in this region, that number is 250,000 or 200,000 workers. Think about how that flows through our regional economy of taking that much earning power, that much wealth, if you will, out of the, out of the economy in this region. So we have to be looking for new areas of growth and be at that forefront of entrepreneurship and leading at innovations. Maybe it's artificial intelligence, maybe it's quantum. The good news about both of those is they require lots of data storage and we still have lots of data storage in this region. So what is the new economy here? Where do we need to be taking our regional economy? Quit thinking about what was in the 1990s and the 2000s and the 2010s and think more about what do we need the structure of our economy to be for the mid 21st century. And then to go along with that, to understand the real estate, how do we change our built environment to adapt to modern ways of working, 
modern ways of living and new technologies. One of the things is I would argue that 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 zoning that is based Euclidean zoning based on specific land uses that are very very specific to you know building heights and setbacks and all that. And but what are what activity is happening on that land is outdated and not particularly useful moving forward. What we want to do is create, we want to do placemaking. We want a sense of place. We want a vibe, a feel. And that can be done with form-based codes. You want to know what things look like. You don't care as much, should can care much, of does that building have retail in it or a daycare center or an office or, you know, something else, which should matter less. And we're seeing all this. And we need to use our land that we have um, Milt Peterson, a famous developer in this area who's now passed away, one, you know, used to talk about lazy land, the spots of land that are underutilized that you could redo. Oh, and by the way, the notion of converting offices to residential, the National Architects Association tells us that maybe 10% of the office inventory in this country can be converted reasonably into residential. So, you know, there will be a few cases here or there, we are seeing some, but it probably means that we need to create new ways of the way we invest in real estate. And we've got to incorporate into that addressing housing affordability. Maybe it comes from technologies like 3D printing. A colleague of mine uh, led a project in um, Richmond uh, summer before last to 3D print a home, a house. It takes three workers to build a house using the 3D, uh, using the the that um, 3D printing kind of methodologies. You got somebody that's directing the flow of the materials, somebody packing the the uh, machine with the materials that that turn into what they're spraying out, and then the person that's kind of the supervisor, or whatever. So you think about cost to savings and effectiveness of that over time. Transportation, we have got to do something about metro. But I tell you what, I'm not in favor of blank checks. They, they need to do things better. Uh, we want to see efficiencies and we want to have multimodal access that basically just creates employment centers that we can connect to. You, you know, live, work, play is a wonderful concept and I like it where it can work. But live, but if you get if you recognize that most people now don't stay in the same job for 20 or 30 years, so you need that mobility across centers so they can live one place and then work in multiple different areas of the community or the region, as it were. But we want to have we want to have access and in, in, in the sense that we want it to be through good services and a well-functioning metro system, but we also have to build roads and bridges. There will be some of you that may be honked off when I say this, but we need a third bridge. Uh, we need a place to put the trucks so that you can get the trucks off the American Legion Bridge, but more importantly, we need the American Legion Bridge to be redesigned. And of course, we had that whole blow up of down the pathway, thought Transurban was going to build it. And Governor Moore decided he didn't like the deal in uh, for Maryland as a part of that deal, so shut it down. So whatever we do now, we've got probably seven years that we've lost in the planning and approval stages to do something about the traffic across the American Legion Bridge, which means that all the investment that Northern Virginia has done in the toll lanes going up to that bridge are going to be less use while we're waiting on something to happen on getting the traffic across the river. Economic development needs to be a little bit different we're doing now. I'm not going, I'll be happy to talk about this individually with any of you, but basically it's just one, the recognition that if you're not from here, you get more than a hundred miles away, people don't, don't care about the differences of which side of the river you're on, whether you're district or whether you're Maryland or whether you're Virginia. It's the DC national capital region. And we need to be thinking about that because that's how our competitor cities do things and organize their economic development efforts, but it needs to be business led. The other one that I'll get to crime and cost of living. I talked a little bit about that. I think there's a return on investment for government to be a in public private partnership realms in something about child care and elder care services that allow more workers back into the workforce, but get it, but not as giveaways as you know, return on investments and you got things, but you're doing things to encourage it and where you get greater tax revenues because of higher levels of income, higher levels of, of retail sales, all of that bit. One of the key ones though that now we're facing is crime. I can tell you that 
owners of businesses that own the companies that occupy some of the businesses downtown, they are not, their staffs are not returning to the office because of COVID issues or all of that, or just a desire to work at home. They are afraid to walk from the metro station to their building place of employment, and therefore they're not coming to the office. We have got to solve the crime issues. It's starting to spread into the neighborhoods. But if you think about it, the national news, and you think about attracting workers, what's, you know, what's leading in some of the news? You know, are we, you know, we're becoming like Chicago has been the last few years. The, the stat that just blows me away is that in the month of June of last year, there were 144 carjackings in the District of Columbia. I don't drive in the District of Columbia unless I have to. Now, that's usually just because it's a hassle. I did wind up driving to a meeting at Gallaudet University um, a couple of months ago, um, but that was, you know, drive in, drive out, and pay, pay attention to your surroundings. And, and I'm not saying that it's all bad neighborhoods or anything, but these things matter, and we've got to figure out a way to address that. And maybe some of it is things, new technologies, facial recognition and stuff, but I'm not sure I want to become like London, where you have basically monitored street cameras on every corner. That just kind of, that, that's still kind of just, uh, it's not that I'm doing any legal, I'm too boring for that, but I, it's kind of like, that's just a little creepy. So what is a solution to some of these issues? So as you can see, we've got a lot of issues that we're going to do, but what we're going to be doing at the center is through a series of, of research and releases, partnering with businesses and folks that have the data we need to do some of these things. Understanding, say, for a real estate developer, how much of their cost is based on the even with a buy rights development, it takes two years for them to get an approval out of one of our communities. Now, I know that folks on the planning zone boards are good-minded people and they think they're protecting, but all those kind of delays, all that uncertainty adds to the cost of housing and adds to the cost of business structures, makes us less competitive. So we're going to be issuing, and I invite you to look for that. There will be a series of articles coming out in the Business Journal. If you are networked with, uh, with our folks here, uh, you will certainly see uh, some of that forwarded, but I invite you to look out for stuff that will appear in the Business Journal and appear in other formats as we're reporting on these, where we hope to offer local leaders not dictates of what they must do, but here's problems, here's the magnitude of the problem, here are some potential solutions, and we hope you as business leaders will agree on some of those solutions so you can help us convince the local leaders that they may have to do some things that might be unpopular with certain parts of their voting public, but things that we got to do if we want to recognize our potential in this region for economic growth and success. Thank you very much. We are now gonna move into the question side of it. And I think what I'll do now, Jen, is I'll go ahead and close the presentation and then we can have folks looking at us. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Clower, for a lot of interesting data today and the fantastic analysis as usual. Uh, we always appreciate your uh, valuable insights. Now we will be um, inviting everyone to join us for our question and answer portion of our webinar today. Uh, we received already a lot of good questions from our audience, but please continue to use your chat feature for any new ones. And we will try to get to as many questions as we can. So let's dive right in. All right, the first one, Bitcoin has surged in the start of 2024. And with the recent SEC approval of Bitcoin ETFs, does this mean electronic currency is here to stay? Yes. Uh, now, whether or not it is here as any kind of official currencies, I'm much more skeptical of that. But this is, you know, this is the finance world equivalent of going to Vegas. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, I, I and and you know, and and I think just, I think that what will it'll still be there. It's going to evolve, but this is another one that Bitcoin. You know, well, anything is like this, but Bitcoin only has value to the extent we, we decide as a as an investing public to buy into any of it, right? Um, I think that you will see some people that. You know, and it's the ones we see, you know, gosh, aren't we the ones that wish that we had bought Bitcoin when it was a dollar and we could be on our, our 
120 foot yacht, you know, cruising around, you know, in the Caribbean or something or another. But I think at this point, there will probably be as many and maybe even more people that will wind up losing their shirts long term on, on Bitcoin than game. I would not ever advise. I, I would certainly say if you've got money in your portfolio that you used to throw into people in junk class bonds and the company investing, that kind of stuff that, hey, put some money in Bitcoin. What the heck? Just be very comfortable that the likelihood is you could lose it just as easy. And I've never quite figured out how you actually effectively traded as rapidly. So that's a good part about the ETF is it will be a way for people that are not technologists to be able to understand how to actually transact. Yeah, so, me included. <laughs> right. Continue with the tech theme. As you noted, the Northern Virginia's data centers have boosted the local economy. What other hot industry could local business owners capital capitalize on during 2024? Stay tuned. We are working on that. Okay. Uh, if I go out and talk to the uh, economic development professionals in the region, we're trying to figure that out. I mean, we have this vast infrastructure and, you know, and, and anything related to data. And remember, it's interesting, like with the co-location facilities that are where, you know, there's lots of people that, you know, that own part of the server, their data is there. They want them to be in metro areas close to, to uh, uh, airports because, oddly enough, they like to come and just see where their data is being stored, <laughs> you know, which is kind of, it's kind of freaky, right? But, but okay. in any case, they, they do. But so there's still that, but, but exactly how do we actuate that into saying what business is there? Now, one of the things that I will tell you is that people underappreciate how being a, 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 in terms of time, we were, we were the, the first real area region that really kind of had that concentration. And because of that, we developed what used to be cottage industries that become full kind of subsectors of construction and you know equipment providers and things like that that are here and who actually are export based businesses because now you know those contractors they may be based here but they're going to Ohio or North Carolina or Texas or Arizona and doing their stuff so you know and then they bring that income back to our region so it, it there's an old overall ecosystem divine what we're trying to figure out is exactly how do we actuate that into if it makes sense for our artificial intelligence functions to be happening close, you know, within low latency, close to the data centers, exactly what does that look like? What are the businesses and how do we, you know, we can identify that we can support those businesses. We're trying to figure that out. It's a great question. If you have insights, by the way, please feel free to email me and let me know. And I'm, I'm happy to chat with you because that's something we're working on this year. And touching back to your, uh, the Metro DC perpetual economic me mediocrity, um, what region should we be looking to uh, who are adapting well in this economy as a guide. I mean, you mentioned Columbus, Ohio, Southeast. What are they doing that DMV is not? Um, is it our public yeah. policy? Should businesses take action? Some of it is policies. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it is the way we regulate. So let's think about just real estate for a moment. You, you, you folks can tell by listening to me talk. I come from Texas. I had no idea what a proffer was before I got here. So this notion that you know you want you want a, a developer to pony up 10 million, 15 million, 5 million, whatever the number is, to contribute to affordable housing programs as a part of the deal, or we want you to build a, a, a fire station, some not where your development is, but someplace else, or do this or that. Understand that is not a fee on developers that goes into the price of housing or the price of the business. So it is the residents and the consumers, the renters, the owners, who are, they're the ones that actually pay for that. And that's some of the stuff we wanna do. But then it's also not just our regulations, it's how we manage it and the fact that it takes, I was sitting with a, a office developer uh, back in the summer, we were having lunch and he had just gotten the approval to build a project that he had originally submitted seven years ago. And of course, his response was, uh, dudes, have you looked at interest rate? That deal's gone. Forget <laughs> it. Not happening. Yeah. You know, and so it's, it's, there are places that do it better. Yeah. And we want to look at their models. But importantly, what I want us to do is because look, land is always going to be expensive here. The cost of construction is always going to be expensive. Mm -hmm. So part of what we have to do is it's not just, how we do it or how we regulate it, it it's what we do in the sense that i want us to see new ways of doing land use regulation 
that are better suited for the 21st century than the late 19th century. Yeah, yeah just times and patient, patience. <laughs> oh, we don't have time for patience. We got to act now. <laughs> um, next question. Inflation continues to be high in some sectors of the economy. With the current turmoil overseas, will the prices at the grocery stores and restaurants continue to increase? Or will we see a bit of stabilization in 2024? So let's break that down into a couple of uh, a couple of subcomponents. Um, and maybe it's because my as, as some of you might remember my undergraduate degree is marine transportation. So I was trained to sail ships. So naturally, I became a professor of public policy, uh, <laughs> as one would do, right? Yeah. But the, the, I am very concerned about the piracy issues that are happening in the Red Sea now, whether it's the Houthis or whether it's the, the uh, Iranian Republic Guard that are doing it, all these. That is a, a flow, and those, con and those transportation costs are starting to escalate, and they will push inflation up higher. And you think about that, that means that the measures of inflation that the Fed looks like are going to be suggesting we can't afford to reduce interest rates now or for something that is a completely external factor to our economy. Yeah. Um, and then the risk now of us seeing that the, the uh, conflict in Gaza starting to spread to the north is very, very concerning. Uh, and at the same time, you've got the the Chinese, you know, rattling the sabers about Taiwan again. I don't know that they're going to invade Taiwan, but it, you know, you just it, there are some lot of challenges. So what does that mean? I think that it means that that things that are more distance that are sourced from overseas are certainly going to be more expensive. Um, how that flows across the various commodities, you know, where are the bananas coming from? Uh, we're seeing in, in some of the elements of food inflation, of course, are being driven by other things here because you know, now, you know, egg prices remain high, large, and, and even the prices of chickens are, are remaining high because of this uh, version of the avian flu that's, you know, decimating some of the flocks in country because you basically if you get a couple of chickens with this avian flu you basically you euthanize the whole flock okay. you know so it's a it's a it's a challenge i think though that prices will continue to reduce in some parts of the sectors but i expect you know it, we haven't seen a big in uh spike in oil prices so far with the increased tensions in the middle east but that will and as you know oil prices then flow through the rest of the economy uh, but I do agree with the person who asked the question that I, I would tend to that I don't expect a spike in inflation. I just think that we'll kind of lose some of the path and that at the end of the year, instead of going from 3.5% to 3%, maybe we get, you know, maybe we drop a, you know, 10 or 20 basis points, but not, you know, not shifting down all the way to what the Fed wants to see. Got it. Got it. Um, can you talk to more about the growth of private education in terms of what it looks like and what's driving the growth? Well, the numbers that we see in there is, I think, more healthcare related than education growth because we are in a bit of a baby bust and we are seeing uh, universities and even to a lesser extent, private uh, K through 12 institutions really struggling now because there are just fewer students. Uh, that are coming to school. So there is there is a real upheaval starting to emerge in higher education. And I think it'll be parts of private education. The thing that may change that somewhat will be individual state policies about things like charter schools and things like that, and which will affect some of that. But most of that growth that we have been seeing is the continuing rebound in health services employment as opposed to the private education. And of course, the health services is, required. you know, oddly, we had a health crisis, but healthcare employment actually went down because we shut down all the elective procedures. And that's still kind of in catch up mode. And of yep. course, the other piece is the tremendous burnout in our healthcare worker population that we've seen, you know, just the, you know, the stress, the risk, everything else. And so it's, we're, there's no place that I know of that's, that has all the doctors and nurses that they would like to have on staff. Yeah, I've heard a lot of travel nurses, right? There's an increase of travel nurses that kind of travel through the country because there's some shortages everywhere that they can't find locally. Yeah. Um, okay, next question. You talked about the housing shortage in the area. How do you balance that need with available space to build? 
it's reimagining spaces. Um, so an example I mentioned earlier that that guy named Milt Peterson, you know, talked talked about Lazy Land. If you think about like a a, a big school, you like take an elementary school that might have five or six acres of land surrounding it, you know, and some of it's playground and some of it's other stuff. You could take an acre of that and maybe get 15, 20 housing units on it, you know, in terms of, you know, condo style, apartment style. And I don't mean having to go up, you know, 20 stories or anything, but you, you, you can, so, and there's lots of little places like that around. So we have to think better of our land juices and, and even some, and education. I tell you one of the coolest things that I have, heard recently is I think Alexandria now has done two conversions of an office building into a school building. Oh. <laughs> it in this region, it cost at least between 180 and 200 million dollars to build a high school. Given the number of office vacancies we have, yep. no school district inside our core region should be spending taxpayer money on building new buildings. Because you think about it, an office ought to be a fairly easy conversion into classroom space. Yep, 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 yep. And just kind of going back to that, you mentioned 10% of the businesses are kind of going to the residential kind of repurposing. Um, what local areas and neighbors do you see this trend taking off? More in the older areas, oddly, and, it's, and that was 10% could be that doesn't mean that it makes economic sense to do Got any it. of them okay. right but where we see it it's actually older structures have floor plates that are actually more conducive than anything built in the last 25 or 30 years so that would suggest it's downtown some of the areas we're building you know where you know the the buildings have been there for 30 or 40 years yeah, or something yeah. like that yeah. is actually a little more conducive so that pretty much precludes this happening in prince william <laughs> or you know or right. uh, you know, uh, Loudon or something like that, you know, just in the time of development stuff. But the thing that I think we need to do there is to understand that for some, the highest and best use of that building is to tear it down and replace it with something else. And to get that done, we're likely to need to do things like some kind of a public-private partnership where maybe the deal can be financed using municipal bond rates as opposed to private bond market bond rates and you think about that differential in the interest price between mm -hmm. a muni bond versus a other and you but you don't do it as a giveaway this is i would never advocate that you just give this all the way to developers that the that the municipality retains an equity stake in it and are getting a stream of revenue for their investment mm -hmm. and you do and so you're encouraging this reuse because what you don't want to have is just absolute derelict buildings in it now I, I, just a little interesting anecdote. Amazon has recently been, because the price of land in Loudoun has gotten so high, they're actually going in and buying some of these vacant office complex to make data centers. So one in, um, in out in Ashburn, it was three older low rise offices that, you know, basically were not market competitive anymore. They bought those, going to tear them down, put up a data center in that space. The other one is a more recent case in Springfield. And it's a building that I think opened in like 2018, an office building, not a big tall one, but maybe three or four stories, has never had a tenant mm. ever. And they bought that and they're going to retrofit the inside and make it a data center. That's perfect. So that, that's a great reuse yep. and of course, great for the, for the, now I'm sure there'll be some neighborhood group will protest all of it, Yeah, uh, but you know, but they, you know, it's like, we need, we need that investment. We need it. We need converting that space. Cause how do you fix the problem in the office markets and the valuations? Well, if you don't need offices anymore, then let's get something Perfect. else built. And what do we need? We yep. need housing. Yep. Um, are there statistics on how many jobs that would have been historically been perform performed by someone who lived or worked locally are now being done by remote workers, like outside of the area? So uh, there is a group that for a while was tracking this, and I haven't seen new data from them in a while. They did national surveys, uh, and this was one that they were they were focused, and I think I reported on this in, a, in one of our previous year things. It was... Um, they were just looking at high wage jobs. So those that were 100,000 or more. Mm -hmm. Now, as you might imagine in the occupations, traditionally uh, 
that those would be things like computer programmers, software developers, and sales reps or sales managers, you know, people who had a territory away from the, the main office, right, represented uh, pre-pandemic about 4% of all high wage occupation jobs. That number went up to around 17, 18% at the height of the pandemic and has been steadily declining now. I think the long run number probably will be something in order of the maybe five or six percent, maybe seven percent, you know, because there, there is a big difference between, you know, connecting with your employees if they're coming to the office once or twice a week or three times a week or every other week or something versus somebody that that only comes to the office once a month or once a quarter or something like that. There's a huge difference in management. One of the things that we have challenged now is the hybrid workforce requires somewhat different management skills, supervisory skills. And we seem to have companies that just don't want to figure out how to train their supervisors to be it's a new managed. territory. <laughs> it, it's completely new. And yeah. so our real market opportunity for all of us who are on this call is to figure out those training regimens and get rich doing the training for teaching managers how to manage a hybrid workforce. Yeah, that's another industry, right? We're just yeah. creating more industries. Um, all right, um, another topic. How will the demographic changes over the next decade with the baby boomers retiring impact our economy? Yeah, two things. One is that as we live longer, baby boomers, you know, are, are look, I am actually a proponent and I'm 63 years old. So maybe it would affect, I'm actually a proponent of just the, this realization we're going to work longer. We got to work longer. Yep. Uh, our, our social security networks and our, all that stuff was not designed for people to be living 30 years past retirement. <laughs> so we need, we need to change something. We need the, we need those workers. Now, the other side of it, it means that though, that as we live longer, we spend more on healthcare, which means we have less money to spend on other things. Yeah. So there's going to be some of that. I am most concerned though, about our congressional inability to come up with a rational program that addresses border security, but still allowing us to bring in workers from anywhere across the world to help fill our labor gaps. Because the fact of the matter is, we simply are not generating enough children to fit to fill it. We are going to become like Japan if we don't do a better job on immigration. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think. Um just i mean I'm, I'm korean so there there's issues about that in korea as well it's like this mm -hmm. we're not going to be existed in um in america if there's no more birth rates or you know increase of our birth rates in here so um and on to immigration it's slightly kind of switching gears but illegal immigration has started to impact social services in many cities and states new york and chicago are overwhelmed with migrants requesting federal assistance. Do you anticipate the federal government to act or will this be a state and local issue? So, you know, in some respects, I, I can appreciate, I, I think that these political stunts of, of Texas, you know, and other states, you know, busing people to other, I, I still think that's more about political stunt than actual policy making. I, I can't I can't help but wonder why when the governor of Florida is paying for people to bus out of Texas to New York, that that somehow is not related to human trafficking for that matter. Right. Yeah. But I can understand where they're saying, hey, this is the stuff we've been facing for decades. Mm -hmm. Now you get a taste of it. It's easy to be nice if you're not the ones providing the services. Right. It, it, so that's why I say, yes, we do have to address border security stuff, but it needs to be done. It, it, you know, what we do now in Congress is just political posturing on both sides. And this issue has just been building and getting worse and we won't do it. And I do. And, you know, I personally think that there is a real challenge about, you know, opening the doors to economic refugees, because then that doesn't provide a societal in, intervention for a reason for them to try to do, you know, fix things better in their country. But if you just think about it, why did we emerge as, as some of the greatest technology generators in the, in fact, the greatest technology generator in the world is because we had people coming from around the world to study at our universities yep. and then stayed here to build the businesses with their brain power. Yeah. We need to retain that. If we, if we start losing that, we start losing. Yeah. I, I mean, that's what America was built on, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one, another one I have is, 
What will the impact of the U.S. debt be on our economy if the current annual deficits continue? Well, interest rates are going to continue to have to be higher because it's competition. Um, you know, it's interesting that, you know, we talk about that. What if the Chinese quit buying bonds? But at this point, the Chinese are so exposed to us that they can't let us collapse because it would, you know, that'd be, you know, it's literally the cutting their financial nose off despite their face, you know, kind of thing. So we'll see it. But we have got to do we cannot continue to pile on the debt. I mean, we're now over 30 trillion dollars. You know, we've, we've got to have some responsibilities. We have, I, I don't know how you would actually do this politically, but we have to make our legislators somehow personally responsible for the decisions that they're making, you know, and it's something like, you know, if you can't pass a budget, then the first thing that gets cut is your federal wage. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, but, you know, but just the notion that that this stuff about the, the new theory of, of public finance is that that public debt doesn't matter as long as you can come up with the cash to pay the, the interest on the loans. That, that doesn't work for us in our home lives. It doesn't work for us in our business lives. Why in the hell would anybody think it works at the federal government level? Yeah. yeah. It'll be interesting the next couple of weeks of how it turns out <laughs> with the potential government shutdown. Um, one more question. Labor force index and our migration. Should D.C. metro area businesses consider a headquarter move to find talent or follow suit with federal and government contractors and hire employees from other regions to find talent? Just kind of. Yeah, it, well, so okay. let's use the headquarters as an example. Two of our biggest government contractors are Boeing and Lidos. Lidos has about 33, 34% of their workforce is in this region. Boeing, who of course just moved their corporate headquarters here recently from Chicago, maybe about, I think four or 5% of their workforce is here wow. regionally. So I think that no matter what happens, these companies where one of their biggest clients is the federal government are going to keep their headquarters here. Yeah. It's just a matter of, are they more like Lidos or are they more like Boeing about the rest of it? And so that's our challenge. If I were, it, look, there are some of the stuff that you can do, but notice I said that there are, there are, there are both advantages and disadvantages to remote work. I've done some academic writing on that. Be happy to share it if you're really incredibly bored and want something to read. Uh, but I, I will tell you that if I were back in the day when I was managing businesses and needed workers, it's gonna the, the trend, what is different in economic development that has emerged over the last you know, 25, 30 years is that companies go where the workers are. Workers don't necessarily go to the companies. And indeed, some work that was done, and I've cited it before in these presentations, but it was it was work that was that came out in October or so of 2022 that said that you know the number one reason the workforce moves now is to find cheaper housing, not finding another job. Yep, that makes sense. I mean, people are moving further, further out, so yeah. that's where we could find housing. Um, I think that's it. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Clara, for another great presentation. And thank you to those attending and participating in today's discussion. We now conclude our webinar today. I hope you all have a rest of a wonderful day today. And thanks so much for joining us. Bye.